barrier on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I've been looking forward to seeing this debate for quite some time. Y'all ready for this? Richard Carrier, an ancient history scholar and author of Sense and Goodness Without God. Yo, I think it's pretty obvious who won this debate. Welcome to Reasonable Faith, Conversations with William Lane Craig. I'm Kevin Harris, and we hope you'll find the topics we discuss enriching and enlightening concerning the big questions of life. Dr. William Lane Craig is a noted philosopher and theologian known for his work on the existence of God, philosophy of time, and the resurrection of Jesus. And we invite you to discover the wealth of resources at reasonablefaith.org. There you'll find Dr. Craig's famous debates with leading atheists, articles, books, podcasts, audio from Dr. Craig's Defenders class, and a question question and answer section featuring amazing questions people send us and answers from Dr. Craig. That's reasonablefaith.org. reasonablefaith.org. Dr. Craig, we're talking about the debate you had on the resurrection with Richard Carrier. And as we've said in an earlier podcast, this was an important debate for a lot of reasons. It was anticipated. A lot of people see Richard Carrier as kind of the atheist hero these days. He has a, uh, a younger following. A lot of people thought, well, if there's anybody who's going to be able to take on William Lane Craig, it's going to be Richard Carrier, because Richard Carrier has been studying him for years, writing about Bill Craig for years, and this is one of those anticipated debates. Let's get into some of the specifics. What are some important biblical exegesis and some other points that you think are important and that will perhaps be written on later? Well, one of the main arguments that did not get aired adequately in the debate was Paul's doctrine of the resurrection body and its relationship to the earthly body. Richard's central argument against the resurrection is that Paul didn't believe in a physical resurrection body but rather a kind of spiritual body, a body made out of spirit, and that this body is numerically distinct from the earthly body that dies and is buried. Richard believes that Paul's doctrine was that the earthly body simply rots away in the grave, and that what God gives to the deceased person is a new spiritual body unrelated to the body that died. And I think that the vast majority of commentators on Paul understand that this is an erroneous reading of 1 Corinthians 15, that, in fact, in 1 Corinthians 15, what Paul is teaching is a transformation of the earthly body or its remains to a spiritual resurrection body. And so I wanted to make two points about Richard's argument here that, well, I did make them in the debate, but he didn't respond, unfortunately. The first one is if this is meant to be an argument against the empty tomb, then there's a huge assumption lying just beneath the surface here, namely that we have no independent evidence for the fact of the empty tomb. Even if Paul believed on theological grounds that Jesus' tomb wasn't empty, that proves nothing if you've got early independent evidence that there was an empty tomb. And in fact, I gave five lines of such evidence. So whatever Paul believed on theological grounds doesn't do anything to deny the fact of the empty tomb if you've got early independent evidence, as as I claimed, of the empty tomb. That was the first point. The second point is I think when you do a careful exegesis of Paul's doctrine in 1 Corinthians 15 and elsewhere in Paul's letters, you find that Paul most definitely believed that it was the mortal body, the earthly body, which will be transformed and made incorruptible and immortal and imperishable and therefore would be made fit for God's eternal kingdom so that he most definitely would have believed in an empty tomb because he believed that it was the remains of the earthly body that would be raised and transformed into this spiritual resurrection body. And another point, Kevin, that's worth mentioning is that it's not just in 1 Corinthians 15 that Paul talks about the transformation of the earthly body to the resurrection body. He talks about this same thing in his other letters, too. And I pointed out in the debate that in Philippians 3.21, Paul says very plainly, he will change our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body, which shows a transformation of the body to the resurrection body. In Romans 8, verses 10 and 11. Paul says that he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead 
will make alive your mortal bodies also. So notice the subject there is the mortal body that will be made alive by he who raised Christ. And then in Romans 8.23, Paul says that we await adoption, the redemption of our bodies. So in all of these passages, Paul clearly affirms the transformation of the earthly mortal body to the resurrection body. Now, Richard didn't respond in the debate to these three passages, but if you look at his written work where he does respond to these passages, you find that the only way he avoids their implication is by mistranslation and distortion of meaning. For example, the Philippians 3.21 passage where Paul says he will change our lowly body to be like his glorious body. Richard points out that the verb there is used elsewhere by Josephus to mean an exchange of clothes, as when I change clothes, that doesn't mean my shirt turns into a new shirt or in my trousers into a new trouser. It means I exchange them. Uh, and so he says, this is inconclusive in Philippians 3.21. Well, the problem with that sort of exegesis is that as Richard himself recognizes, and as I quoted him, when interpreting words and phrases, context, context is everything. And when Josephus uses the word to indicate a change of clothing, he is very clear. What Josephus says in this passage in the Jewish War is that uh, a certain woman is told by, uh, I think it was David, to put aside her robes that she normally wears and to put on the garments of an ordinary citizen and go visit Ahijah the prophet. And so it says, and so, having changed, she went to visit Ahijah. Well, obviously, the context there means changed clothes. But in Philippians 3.21, that's not the context. The context is talking about the resurrection, and it says he will change our lowly body to be similar to his glorious body. And so there, the context is one of intrinsic change, not exchange, uh, like in clothing. Take Romans 8, verses 10 and 11, and that says that he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will make alive your mortal body also. What Richard says there is that that translation is grammatically incorrect, that grammatically the also cannot go with the participle, he who raised Christ Jesus. He says that it, the also doesn't go with the participle, it goes with the previous verb in the previous sentence where it talks about the indwelling spirit. And so this is indicating that right now God's spirit will give life to your mortal body. It's not talking about the resurrection. Well, when I check this out, Kevin, this is simply flat wrong grammatically. You can give numerous examples in Paul of where the word also connects with a prior participle. For example, Paul says, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. And there the also is definitely connecting the word with the previous participle. There are numerous other examples of this sort uh, in Paul's letters and in other letters in the New Testament. So Richard is just flat wrong there. And the conceptual relation between he who raised Christ from the dead and then the verb make alive, indicating resurrection, shows that the also there is connecting with the participle. He who raised Christ will make alive your mortal bodies also. It is a promise of the resurrection, and Richard's grammar here is just mistaken.